Good evening and welcome everybody to the 41st University of Buckingham Great Minds Great Lives virtual fireside talk and tonight we have the very distinguished historian and biographer Andrew Roberts uh, and we're going to be looking at Andrew's very considerable body of, of work and talk about his uh, thoughts on his writing and his subjects. If you're new to the series, you won't perhaps know that um, uh, you can ask questions. We love getting questions, particularly if they're short, uh, type them in. Um, and if you uh, are not on a system whereby you can get in, uh, then do send them to the vice chancellor's office uh, at Buckingham and we'll pick them up. Um, my colleague who's listening to this uh, and send uh, uh, and type them in for you. So we, we like to have as many questions as possible. Um, and uh, let's get straight down to business. Uh, and the first question, Andrew, is uh, one of the great differences with uh, this uh, and having you on the stage at Oxford or uh, at Cheltenham or, or, or um, uh, wherever uh, is hey is that we can come into your home and Andrew tell us about the room that you're in and is this the room that inspires you and that you write in? Uh, no I don't write in here it's my drawing room at uh, my uh, home in London um, but it's it's uh, the room that I read in and um, so I have a couple of extremely comfortable chairs behind me there and uh, a table with the um, books that I've, I'm reading at the moment and um, I hugely enjoy whenever I've got a moment to, uh, and I'm not writing, to uh, to sit here and um, and read. So uh, it's my pretty much my favourite room of the house, and it's got some lovely bits and pieces as well. I've got uh, uh, an invitation to Lord Nelson's funeral um, up on the wall behind me, and an invitation to Queen Victoria's coronation, and various other bits and pieces. What my wife calls bric-a-brac. <laughs> do you uh, do, do you like to write uh, at home, or do you do you travel to Chartwell uh, or to, to the places uh, where your subjects uh, lived and breathed and worked? I definitely do that whilst I'm doing the research, um, but I can only really um, work at home now. I used to uh, go off to a um, a tiny little um, room. It, it grandly calls itself a farmhouse, but it wasn't in the Dordogne that my um, aunt used to own, where there was no electricity and no telephone. And so it was wonderful. You would go and uh, get all the food from the local casino and you would um, eat it until it all went off. Nobody could call you. Um, there was no cell reception and no other humans. There was a, two weeks I never saw another living person. And you can really concentrate there, do sort of 16 hours a day writing and get 5,000 words a day written. But um, but now, unfortunately, um, I uh, I do it all from home. And you say written, Andrew, do you handwrite? Or use a, my, a first two books, my first two books I, I wrote by hand, um, but now I uh, type. I, um, I did try that thing when it came out at the beginning where you uh, dictate and, uh, and the words come up on the screen. Now it's very, very good. But when I started, when I was writing my biography of Lord Salisbury, every single time I said Salisbury, it came up saying Sainsbury. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and there, was, ah. there was an article I was afraid to write um, about the bombing of Guernica in the uh, Spanish Civil War. And when I uh, pointed out that there were munitions in um, the city, uh, it came out as musicians. Yes, so altogether, that, altogether different. Uh, a bit nerve-wracking that one of these would get uh, typos would get into the final copy, so I chucked that. Uh, well, well, Salisbury to Sainsbury is nothing into what Buckingham comes up if uh, <laughs> uh, you dictate, uh, and indeed that's happened in several of my hasty uh, emails. Um, Causing deep embarrassment. I mean, moving on from from that, did you uh, did you always have a sense that you would become uh, a writer? A and what was it, Andrew? Um, I mean, there, there, you have a life uh, that uh, is the envy of vast numbers of people. You you write 
Uh, you know everybody. Um, you're enormously successful and in demand. Did you imagine that when you were uh, at school, who or what inspired you? At, 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 way, at boarding sure. school or at, at, at Confell and Keys, Cambridge? What? I'm not sure it's true that uh, people really do want to have my life. I, I start work between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning uh, every day. It's not, uh, it's actually a bit of a dog's life, frankly, when it comes to uh, to writing. So don't, um, don't romanticise it too much, uh, <laughs> Anthony. Um, I, I loved history. My father read history at uh, Oxford. I um, loved it at school. I had a tremendously good uh, history teacher when I was young called Christopher Perry. I was very lucky at Cambridge to have dons like Norman Stone teach me and so um, it was my first love. However, when I left Cambridge I went into the city um, where I stayed for two years until I discovered that I was uh, functionally innumerate and uh, had to try and find something else to do and uh, came up with this idea or at least a friend of mine who was a literary agent uh, who I'd been at university with, came up with this idea of my writing a biography of Winston Churchill's uh, and Neville Chamberlain's Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax. But I'd never thought of actually trying to earn a living as a writer until it became perfectly clear to me that I couldn't earn it um, uh, as a banker. So um, I'm just going to pick you up on that early start there, Andrew. So if you have been out to dinner in the days when one uh, could do that if anyone can remember. Are you still getting up? Uh, is that when you're getting up or when you're at your desk? A and doesn't that mean you get very early burnout? So by two in the afternoon, you're pretty much dead. Yes, it does. And so, so between two and uh, two forty-five every afternoon of my life, I have a Churchillian nap. I go upstairs and uh, and get into my pajamas and go to bed for forty-five minutes. And uh, as Churchill pointed out, it means that you have two days effectively out of one because when you get back to your desk at about three o'clock you can carry on writing all the way through to uh, to supper time. I didn't know that um, and so so Robert Fleming's loss uh, was um, uh, history's gain but that's a heck of a gamble to have left the security of a uh, of a, a lifelong career, presumably what it would have been in a bank, um, for the perils and insecurities of writing. I mean, you could have gone and done a doctorate at, at Buckingham, for example. Uh, did you think about a doctorate uh, and uh, did you have a, an, uh, a contract already lined up for Holy Fox, uh, the name of the Halifax biography? I did. Um, I had a contract which was organised by Andrew Loney, the uh, the literary um, editor, who's still a literary editor today, very successful one in charge of Andrew Loney Associates. And this is one actually, this is one piece of advice that I very much give anybody who's thinking of, of um, making a career as a writer, is you must have a literary agent. Only 2% of unagented books get published. So don't just write a book on spec and hope that it's published because there's a very good chance, 98% chance that it won't be. Um, so I was very fortunate in, in knowing Andrew, as I say, from university. Uh, he got me the contract. It wasn't huge, um, a huge amount of money. I was very fortunate in having tremendously generous parents who believed in me and, and gave me a chance to spend three years researching and writing a book that actually, I think I've met everybody who bought that book. It was not a bestseller by any means, but it did get, thankfully, some uh, some lovely uh, reviews, which meant that George Weidenfeld, the publisher, was willing to um, give me a reasonable amount of money for my second uh, book. So tell us about um, about Halifax and what it was that you were saying. I mean, this extraordinary uh, figure uh, at the time and what you were saying about appeasement also that was fresh and arresting. I remember the first time I came across your name, Andrew, was with the book that did actually make a big splash when it was published. Um, it was 
lucky, really, that nobody had done a written a biography of um, Halifax since the 19, early 1970s. And so there were an awful lot. And I was also very fortunate. There were about 100 people who I could dash around back in those days um, and interview. Um, 100 people, many of whom had worked with, uh, with Winston Churchill and uh, Lord Halifax in the Foreign Office. And Neville Chamberlain, and so I, I got a, I spent a lot of time really with that book, just, um, just having interviews all around the country with these elderly, very elderly in some cases, over a hundred in a couple of cases, um, people whose, um, whose memories, some of them were, um, were shot to pieces. But frankly, uh, it was a wonderful time of my life. I absolutely loved listening to these anecdotes of of people who had uh, lived through you know, the most perilous times of our country. So so that was something that I enjoyed. As far as what was new was concerned, was I was very fortunate that it dawned on me about halfway through the researching of that book that uh, Halifax had actually turned against appeasement when Hitler invaded um, Prague and the rump of Czechoslovakia in March 1939. And in fact, from that moment onwards, he was a anti-appeaser. And that uh, was something that no earlier historian had picked up. So I had at least something new to uh, to add in the book. And then you were on, that was published in 1991, 1994, uh, Eminent Churchillians. Um, to tell us about the, 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 the Straight and, uh, uh, and what was the, the idea? The second book is often the book that makes or breaks a, a, a writer. That's right. Yes. Well, I took a, a risk with that uh, book because um, it was a highly revisionist book. It was aggressive. And uh, I was a I was sort of angry young man, enfant terrible kind of thing. It's weird to think of that 30 years ago um, as I'm a, a very uh, a sort of happy with the uh, status quo today, I'm afraid. Um, in those days, I was I was a um, ill tempered, um, quite radical person who um, who wrote um, aggressive essays, six aggressive, um, tough, hard hitting uh, um, essays attacking people like Lord Mountbatten and uh, uh, Churchill's Labour Minister, uh, Sir Walter Monckton, and the historian Sir Arthur Bryant, who I was very fortunate to find a whole load of papers um, making it quite obvious that he was a Nazi, pro-Nazi fellow traveller in the 1930s. Um, and uh, and various other um, uh, articles, uh, various other essays about people, and so it um, it sort of uh, was a bit marmite, really. That book. There were a lot of reviewers that uh, took me to task for various things that I said, but luckily uh, the majority of them, even though they said that they didn't necessarily agree with what I was saying, did say that it was well researched and uh, acerbically written. And so um, that in, in itself also, uh, luckily the sales of that were, were, were strong and therefore I was able to get a, um, an advance that I could, I could genuinely live off for my, my third book. Uh, and it was brave, Andrew. I mean, to take on Lytton uh idea uh, of uh, with eminent Victorians uh, and to, to, to see yourself in that mould was early on marking you out as somebody who was going to uh, uh, be a, a, a writer of, of note, um, of courage uh, with their own, very much their own points of view. And, and the Arkin Memorandum, a, a novel in 1995, not oft repeated by you uh, <laughs> novel writing since, um, uh, was that inspired by Robert Harris or, or, or how, did, how did that come about? Um, <laughs> it, it reminds me actually of a line of Churchill's when he wrote his, his one novel, Savrola, and he told all his friends not to read it or to, or to buy it. I have much the same kind of complicated relationship with that uh, novel. It attempted to be a, um, uh, <laughs> it attempted to be a sort of dystopian futuristic novel, a whodunit, um, a, uh, um, it had sort of sex scenes that make me cringe terribly today. Um, so all in all, it's something that I don't encourage my friends to uh, <laughs> to read. But thank you very much for, for mentioning it after all these years. <laughs> but you weren't cited in the Bad Sex Awards. <laughs> Was I? You, I you, you were. I, I, um, I, and, if I'd uh, known that, I'd forgotten it. <laughs> uh, 
and and then you seriously um, uh, became part of the um, uh, of the writing um, establishment with your book on Salisbury, a vast uh, tome, uh, Victorian Titan, uh, that won the Wilson History Prize uh, and the James uh, Stern Silver Pen and and other distinctions, and was showered in. Praise. Why were you, were you picking uh, Salisbury? Famously, you dedicated it to Margaret uh, Thatcher. Um, were you seeing Salisbury as a pre-Thatcher? Can you explain for everyone who doesn't know about that long-serving prime minister at the end of the 19th and beginning of the last century? Yes, he was prime minister for 13 years. He was really in a um, uh, a triumvirate with Gladstone and Disraeli, who of course are far better known. He brought the British Empire to the largest extent that it uh, ever uh, reached. He was, uh, <coughs> apart from maybe after the First World War, it depends how you um, how you uh, uh, work it out. But um, he was a uh, he was an extraordinary figure. He was a aristocrat, but also um, something of a philosopher, a highly intelligent man. Uh, uh, angry, acerbic uh, for much of his life, poverty stricken in an aristocratic sense in his uh, young life because he was a younger son who then suddenly on the death of his brother uh, became the third Marquess of Salisbury and uh, served in Disraeli's cabinet and, uh, and really took over from him after Disraeli's death. And he was a fascinating figure, a man with intense contradictions, um, he uh, he was somebody who I thought was worthy of um, a book almost as, as long as your own book on Churchill's Indian Summer, uh, Anthony. And uh, very fortunately, it as you as you mentioned, it, it won these prizes, one of which the silver pen, which I haven't thought about for years and years. I, I, I you do actually get a silver pen, a beautiful sort of Dunhill silver pen, which I moronically left on an aeroplane. Um, and so I lost. It's uh, one of the great uh, regrets and sadnesses of my career, I have to say. So how do you uh, work uh, on a book of a man uh, for whom you presumably definitely could not have uh, interviewed anybody who knew him? Um, how did you get so well inside the mind uh, of uh, Salisbury? I, I read his journalism and because he was poverty stricken, uh, he in order when once he got married, uh, he'd fallen out with his father who wouldn't give him any money. And so he went into journalism and uh, wrote for um, the Saturday Review. And um, so as he was uh, was um, having his young family and desperately needed money, he uh, he wrote these articles about absolutely anything and everything, frankly. Uh, and that was the way, really, that um, one could work out what he was thinking before he went into uh, into politics. And it's very interesting how many of the phrases and the quips and the quotations actually he then went on to use when he was prime minister. And a depressive. I remember you um, saying of Churchill, I might have got this wrong, but you didn't think that he was depressed. Uh, uh, was there more uh, of Churchill in Salisbury or more of Thatcher? He got depressed. I, the thing about uh, Churchill is, of course, he did get depressed. He got depressed when when terrible things happened and when Tobruk fell or Singapore fell or whatever. But he was not a depressive in that he wasn't um, preternaturally disposed towards it through a chemical imbalance or anything like that. Um, Salisbury was also a, a, a depressive, but a genuine um, uh, depressive. I, I'm writing about George III at the moment, who I, I'm absolutely certain was a manic depressive. And you do see it in uh, in history crop up uh, again and again, this, uh, this um, terrible debilitating disease. Um, and with, Ch and with uh, Salisbury, um, he was he was he was depressed as well about the state of the nation constantly. He thought that all change was for the worse, as he put it, and therefore it is our duty to, to for as little of it to happen as possible. Um, and of course, in the Victorian age where where things were progressing, um, he, he, he was depressed by that uh, on a macro scale, as well as various things that happened in his own life. 
And tell us about your relationship with Margaret uh, Thatcher and how that had developed since she fell from power. And she, of course, was, depending how you want to phrase it, quite depressed to be out of power, not to be able to change things um, any longer. Yes. Well, she, um, as, I, as you mentioned, I, I uh, dedicated Salisbury to her, uh, a thrice elected a liberal Tory, which um, which she liked uh, that because, of course, that was also uh, Lord Salisbury. Um, she used to come around here for dinner and I'd go to her um, house, which is about 200 yards away from here. Uh, she appointed me to take her place on the Margaret Thatcher Archive Trust. And you're absolutely right. She was um, she was very depressed at the uh, when she fell from power. Um, but she quite liked being called prime minister, rather like American presidents are um, uh, or still called Mr. President for the Madam President for the rest of their lives. Um, Margaret Thatcher liked being called prime minister, even though we don't have that tradition here in uh, in England. Was she ever happy after she left office in November 1990? Um, gosh, that's a good question. When you went on holiday with her, which I did on a couple of occasions, um, she would be contented. That's slightly different from, from happy. She had no small talk. She would uh, come up to you at a party and say, uh, so Andrew, what do you think of NATO at the moment? <laughs> it's a <extremely laughs> off-putting way of, uh, of, of having a conversation. But um, but when you when you did have these, uh, have these um, conversations, sometimes long into the night, because uh, she liked her whiskey and so and so do I like talking. Um, I never found a, a true real contentment after after she had been um, defenestrated. And, and by the time your Salisbury came out, the, the Tories were out of office and and it, it, it landed in a more hostile uh, environment. Um, there, uh, there was now uh, Labour was in ascendancy, New Labour specifically with uh, Blair. Um, you, you seem to adapt to that. I mean, you first became um, a, a well-known figure to American, um, the American public, uh, if I got this right, commenting about the Diana uh, funeral. I remember you on Newsnight um, uh, talking uh, about it. Um, uh, not going w w w with the uh, the hype and the uh, and and the uh, mass uh, hysteria. Um, how did you adapt yourself to, to this new world? Well, I'd I'd always try to um, do as much television as possible in those days um, because it sells books. You know, you can talk to an audience uh, literally a thousand times larger than any audience that you could fit into a. Uh, into a you know village hall uh, at a at a um, literary festival, and um, so it's it's madness not to um, go on TV if you can, and in America of course you can multiply that by another hundred times or so because there are just so many Americans. And uh, when NBC asked me to uh, to comment on the funeral of uh, of Princess Diana because I'd known her and, and met her a few times. Um, I, I jumped at it, frankly, and since then I've done all of the NBC royal broadcasts. Uh, one of the lovely things about it is it means that you can actually have a front row seat at these great occasions like the uh, um, Queen Mother's funeral or um, Prince William's wedding and so on. And uh, it's um, it's paid as well. So all in all, um, I can't think that there's any good reason not to do it. Some historians are rather de haut en bas about it and think that it's a uh, it's a sort of sideshow that uh, I'm um, I'm being uh, a bit sort of un non historical for doing, but I enjoy it and uh, and it pays for my skiing holidays. You uh, then could have gone almost anywhere with your writing, but you went into uh, the Second uh, World War with um, the Storm of War, uh, a new history of the Second World War, but also Masters and Commanders, how Roosevelt, Churchill, uh, Marshall and Alan Brooke, who was the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, uh, uh, won the war. Tell us about why the Second World War um, and what you were saying, because um, you, you really put the cat amongst the pigeons. 
Well, I was very lucky. Again, I, the, the Second World War had always interested me. My first book, of course, was about Churchill's uh, Foreign Secretary. But the I hadn't done uh, military history ter terribly much. Uh, a couple of small books on it, but nothing really that had uh, that had, um, uh, as you say, put the cat amongst the pigeons. And I was incredibly fortunate when I was uh, researching at Churchill College, Cambridge, um, to find the um, verbatim accounts of the War Cabinet, which had been taken down in hieroglyphics and uh, and a form of shorthand by the Cabinet Secretary's secretary. And they were supposed to have been burnt in the Cabinet Office grate, and they weren't. Uh, this uh, the, the chap who took them down just took them home. And then uh, in the 1970s, when he died, his widow gave them to Cambridge, amongst many other papers, and nobody had looked at them. And I must admit, I came across them entirely by serendipity. I, 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 I was supposed to be catching the five o'clock train and, uh, and I, I clearly missed that. So I asked for some papers that I hadn't heard of who Lawrence Burgess was. And, um, and quickly, when I saw these, uh, these papers, I worked out that they were, in fact, every word taken down in Winston Churchill's Second World War War Cabinet. So we know who said what in each of these meetings, which um, turned out, of course, as you can imagine, to be sort of historical gold dust and made the basis of this uh, this book, Masters and Commanders, which um, really argued that the uh, military, that the, the, the grand strategy of the Western Allies was created through a sort of minuet that was danced between these four people, the two political leaders, um, Churchill and Roosevelt, and the two military leaders, um, Marshall and, and Alan Brook. And sometimes the Americans would be on one side against the Brits, sometimes the politicians would be on the same side against the um, soldiers. And uh, the, the creation of grand strategy comes through uh, seeing this through, through the prism of these four people. So it was a it was an enjoyable um, and fascinating book to write, but I'm the first to admit that actually it was a tremendous stroke of luck that uh, I came across these papers, which made it uh, uh, really groundbreaking. I just want to convey there the extraordinary excitement, the unbelievable excitement as a historian of finding virgin papers, especially something so magnificently seminal as the uh, not the rather dry records, official minutes circulating around Whitehall, but the the, the raw verbatim uh, script about what was actually said at this most important uh, decision making body in the Second World War. I mean, amazing. And presumably, Andrew, that you, you've never had so much uh, another repetition of serendipity in finding archives like that. No, I was really lucky with Salisbury that I um, uh, I found his brother's his uh, his brother's unpublished autobiography in, a, in an attic of one of the uh, family. And I was very lucky um, also in finding some, uh, for the Storm of War book, uh, finding a, a letter which proves that Adolf Hitler uh, was not intending to try to make peace with Britain at the time of the fall of, um, of Dunkirk, the Dunkirk evacuation. So I have found other things in, in other books. Just, but that, just yeah. explain, explain a bit more about that, because... Oh, well. the, yeah, that is so historically interesting and yeah. underpins so much popular writing about the war and films as well. Yes, the um, uh, there's a there's a man who has a enormous, I think, the largest private uh, collection of Second World War um, documents in uh, in the world, and uh, he invited me to to um, look around his archive, which I then spent weeks in and came across a letter from um, Alfred Yerdl, the, um, the Deputy Chief of Staff of, of, of the Führer headquarters, um, dated the 25th of, uh, of May 1940, which is just after the Hitler's halt order, uh, making it clear that the Führer was expecting to, uh, to capture the whole of the British Expeditionary Force over the um, forthcoming uh, three days. And um, so it, so the, the conspiracy theory that Hitler did not try to capture the BEF um, because he wanted to try and make peace with, uh, with the British government is completely shot through by the, uh, by the letter that I found. 
I hope this is making our listeners serious about keeping your own uh, archives, but also looking at um, uh, archives themselves. It, it, it is so uh, extraordinarily uh, rewarding and illuminating. So those are some of the other discoveries. Tell us now about Napoleon uh, shooting for. Did you, uh, what were you trying to do? Give us, uh, what were you trying to do in that book, Andrew? And give us a feeling for who Napoleon actually was. Well, he wasn't the monstrous tyrant that uh, British uh, historians for the last 200 years have tended to make him out uh, to be. He was a man with a great sense of humour. He was a man who uh, wanted to genuinely um, uh, create a meritocracy in France, A somebody who, uh, when, he, when his army went into the, um, the uh, ghettos and the shtetls, freed the Jews, who, so the idea that he was anything like Adolf Hitler, as he's been made out to be by so many uh, proto-Hitler, by so many British historians, I found to be completely absurd and, and wrong. Um, so I wrote this uh, this book, but I also wanted to um, get the reader to understand what he was in terms of being a military uh, strategist and tactician. Um, and uh, and a military genius. So I visited 53 of Napoleon's 60 battlefields um, in 10 countries. And uh, I went to St. Helena, this tiny little um, island in the middle of the Atlantic where he spent the last five and a half years of his life um, and, uh, and visited many, many places, uh, most of his palaces and so on, to try to get a sense of the man. And it was... Uh, it was a, it was a, again a wonderful time. What one has to uh, try and do if you're a historian and you're writing about uh, things that take place in foreign countries is to go and visit them because I don't believe that you can certainly as a military historian um, be a um, be a military historian and not go to battlefields because you can tell so much about them from the topography and so on, especially if they're unchanged. Many of them, of course, are, are changed, but nonetheless, if they're not, I think it's a bit like. Um, uh, being a detective and not bothering to go to the scene of the crime, frankly. So what's happening to you, Andrew, when you, for example, go to St Helena, were, uh, were there? Uh, is that just a purely intellectual experience? No, Do you not feel all, no. any sense of, of, of some kind of supernatural connection with, <laughs> uh, the, with, with, with any sense of uh, the spirit of the figure? still there? Um, what's actually happening to you? I think what you get there, um, and um, and I'm glad you asked me about this because it's the bicentenary of Napoleon's uh, death and next year St Helena is putting on an exhibition and uh, in fact the whole of France seems to be putting on exhibitions. Uh, but when you actually go there, and the, the house itself at Longwood um, has been destroyed by termites in the 1920s, so the only actual bit of the house that's still there are the five steps, stone steps going up to the front door. But it's been rebuilt in, in the same way that it was, and some of his furniture, his bed, for example, uh, that he died in is, is there. Um, so, yes, you're not trying to necessarily get a supernatural sort of metaphysical connection with the man. But what you are trying to do and what certainly I, I did do um, was to. Well, first of all, I, I did something that you can't do nowadays because they've got an a, a airstrip um, now. But um, the only way I could get there before the, um, the airstrip was put down was by uh, was by boat. And it's a six day journey from the from Cape Town and of course he was on a very long much longer journey itself but you 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 come into uh, the only uh, town there it's a tiny island eight eight miles by ten bang in the middle of the Atlantic second most um, remote inhabited island in the world and um, and two thousand of the people of the three thousand people who live there have never set foot off the island and so you, you turn up actually seeing the cliffs that he saw um, and you can feel the intense sense of um, claustrophobia because this is a man who was master of Europe for, for a decade and he was then confined, dying of cancer for the last few years of his life, um, on this tiny little uh, windswept rock in the middle of the Atlantic. And unless I, I think unless you go to these places, you can't really write that last chapter of his life, uh, understanding what it's like. 
Had you been there in those five and a half years, what would, would be the one question most wished you'd asked him? Golly, what a great question uh, that is, actually. I suppose I'd have tried to have asked him, probed about his uh, sense of personal destiny. Uh, mm -hmm. Where did he get that from? He, he believed he had his own star that guided him and uh, it wasn't an ideological star, it was very much a personal um, driving sense of personal destiny and I'd like to know did that come from his his parents, from his education, from the French Revolution, from his uh, immense uh, autodidacticism, where, where, what, what was it? It wasn't a religious sense, he wasn't a religious man, but uh, where did that, that come from? And had I been there, by the way, had I been, instead of Sir Hudson Lowe, had I been governor of St. Helena, I'd have done the exact opposite. <laughs> and I'd have sucked up to him like crazy and I'd have written down everything that he said <laughs> rather than ignoring him and, and trying to uh, block him at every moment. It's hard to think of any figure in Britain, England or Britain, who has had the same impact on their country uh, after 200 years. Could you just briefly uh, assess, and obviously with the 200th anniversary coming up, there'll be a lot more of this, but the sense of what difference did Napoleon make to France and why has he been so enduringly important? What he really did was to save the best bits of the French Revolution, mm -hmm. ideas like equality before the law, meritocracy, um, religious toleration and so on. And he got rid of the um, of the bad bits, the, the, the mad bits like the 10 day week or the cult of the <laughs> being and uh, and also the nasty bits like the, the guillotining. There was only one mass guillotining in the whole of, of Napoleon's uh, reign and that was when uh, 20 people tried to assassinate him. Um, so, so that was the, the basis of it. Before Napoleon, um, you very much had the same status in society, rank and, and status in society as your father and grandfather had had. Um, once Napoleon had taken over and he made, of his 26 marshals, 13 of them came from uh, the labouring classes, the working classes, the servant classes. I mean, it really was, um, and th these people all became counts, some of them princes and dukes, two of them kings. Now that had never happened uh, before, uh, really, you have to go back to, to Rome, really. And um, even then, it was a highly stratified, stratified social society. So he was a, uh, he was a, a great uh, reformer, of course, with the uh, civil code as well, which uh, which he imposed. They've been trying to get it into the law for years, but um, but it, it required him to uh, to push it through. Um, all sorts of things. There are there are five or six major institutions in in France uh, which still exist that Napoleon set up: the the Banque de France, the the Bourse, um, the Conseil d'État. Um, he really was a, a, a man who, although of course he did lose his last battle and died in exile, nonetheless has had an enormous uh, effect on uh, on France and uh, and the rest of Europe too. And indeed, you can't be in Paris without feeling his his presence. Well, of course, uh, he one of the four bridges he he built, or taking advantage uh, of the of the reservoirs. You know, the whole thing is uh, is is very much um, a Napoleonic uh, construct. Can I remind everyone here to, I'm going to be asking Andrew about Churchill and then we're going to come over to, to questions. Uh, we have well over 3,000 um, uh, listening to this. It would be a very, very big marquee at, at Cheltenham, um, <laughs> possibly big, um, to, to, to be um, uh, to, to accommodate you all. Um, so on to, to uh, the book about Churchill there, have been tens of thousands of books on Churchill, and I think I'm going to get this number wrong, 1,009 biographies. Um, uh, yours has been uh, widely um, uh, described on both sides of the Atlantic and beyond as the finest single volume uh, book uh, biography, indeed the finest biography of uh, this man. Um, why did you choose him and how Andrew, does one set about writing a, a, a book of Winston Churchill, someone about who so much has been written? Um, well, you've got the, the number right, in fact, it is a thousand and, and nine. So before you <laughs> set set off and write the 1010, <laughs> you, uh, you have to have a slight sense that you know where um, what you're going to say and, and, and try and say something new. And 
Um, here too, I was tremendously uh, lucky. Again, I don't, I don't put it down to archival um, genius. It wasn't. I was very fortunate that um, the Queen allowed me to be the first Churchill biographer to use her father's diaries, uh, wartime diaries. And so King George VI, of course, met Churchill and they had an audience. Um, Churchill had an audience with the King every Tuesday of the Second World War. Unfortunately, the King wrote down everything Churchill said. And so we have this extraordinary and wonderful um, new source. But on top of on top of that, uh, the Russian ambassadors' diaries have been published in uh, in Moscow from the period 1932 to uh, 43. There have been 50 sets of papers that have been deposited by people who work with Churchill and knew Churchill since the last major biography of uh, him, written by Roy Jenkins um, about um, 18 years ago, and. We also have um, some papers like uh, Churchill's daughter's wartime diary, Mary Soames's uh, wartime diary. So there's been a, quite extraordinarily a sort of cornucopia of new sources, which I felt I could, um, you know, work on and, and use to uh, to create um, a, a worthwhile new book about him. Um, and I remember. 40 years ago, going to Martin Gilbert, who wrote the multi-volume official biography. And I went down to the basement of his house. I think it was Notting Hill. Yeah. Uh, and he had a whole series of shelves with stacks of papers, which were for each day of uh, Churchill's life. Um, that the work of, of compression uh, and making clarity out of so much and integrating the new sources and saying something original, keeping that narrative line going. Did you ever feel overwhelmed by it or were you always strongly confident? I No, I felt overwhelmed by it pretty much every day of the of the four years that it took me to write that book. Um, it uh, uh, There's a huge sense of frustration because you never have to go more than a couple of pages of any speech of Churchill's, including really sort of serious budget street speeches, without coming across some some joke or some aperçu, some wonderfully quote, quotable remark. But the trouble is you simply can't uh, fit them in to a single volume biography. Uh, it's a big book, mine, but um, I had taken five million words of notes for that book. And so and you could only ever fit 10 percent of that in. And so it's a constant act of compression and excision. And um, in fact, the New York Historical Society asked me to uh, to give a speech the other day because the publishers asked me to cut 60,000 words from the first draft that I gave them, which is um, which is an enormous amount. And they were right. But they said that otherwise the glue on the um, on the spine of the book wouldn't work. Um, it, would, it would just give way. So I had to make it uh, shorter. It was a painful thing to do, but it did at least allow me to go off to New York and give a speech about the bits that I had to cut out. And we're going to start filtering in the questions now. Sarah's asking, single volume, uh, weren't you tempted, Andrew, to write two or, or three volumes as Charles Moore did on, on uh, Margaret Thatcher? What, what, yes. what was that calculation? Funnily enough, my my editor, Stuart Prophet, is the same uh, person as who allowed um, Charles to uh, to write Margaret's biography in three volumes. And yet he wouldn't allow me to write um, Churchill's in two volumes. But the fact is that there's a there's a very strong um, commercial reason. Uh, people don't tend to buy the second volume. Um, which is very strange considering in Churchill's life, of course, it's the second volume which covers the uh, Second World War that um, that is the key one. Uh, so unfortunately, I was I was stuck in a sort of publisher's nexus, um, but I do understand the uh, the sheer commercialism behind it. And um, we've got a question here from Joe who's saying, what did you <laughs> What most surprised you that you did not know about Churchill when researching and writing it? That's another very, very good question. Um, I think it was in the Queen's, um, in the Royal Archives, uh, in the King's Diaries, the criticisms that uh, Churchill made to um, to the King, knowing perfectly well they would go no further. 
uh, he uh, criticisms he didn't even make to his entourage or to his uh, family, let alone to uh, the public or uh, the press or parliament. Um, criticisms of, of FDR, the um, American president, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, he criticized him over the deployment of, um, of uh, ships at Pearl Harbor. Um, he uh, he criticised him over his uh, attempts to de what he thought was destabilise the British Empire towards the end of the war. Uh, he made lots of um, of quite harsh criticisms of FDR, whilst of course knowing that FDR was absolutely central to um, to Britain surviving in the uh, in the war and thriving in various theatres of the war. So, so that was the biggest surprise. Really, it was quite how outspoken he was privately to a person the only person in Whitehall who wasn't after his job uh, and somebody who was uh, who took his secrets to the grave like the, the king did. Whole range, thank you for that, whole range of questions now from Anne who says, uh, Anne's been looking at your, your room all the time and asking you, Andrew, how many volumes uh, do you have and do you know? Not the, first idea. Not the first idea. And this is only one of three of three books, uh, three um, rooms that are, that are covered in books. Um, I'm a, I'm a huge reviewer. I review, I don't know, 50 uh, or so, maybe more books a year. And uh, and and I never like to um, to part with a book that I've reviewed. I, when I was younger, always used to take people's books to get signed. I think I did it with you, Anthony. I think I've got a couple of your your uh, signed books here in this uh, in this uh, library, and so I never throw those away either because they're a personal connection. And so, unfortunately, um, as Antonia Fraser says, books breed, and uh, and so if you, uh, if you have a lot of books in your uh, in your house, you find that. Uh, that you very quickly they, they wind up in the uh, in the bathroom even. I'm going to Louise now, who who says that she's a student at, at Buckingham, and she would love to get a book published. Um, she has written uh, fictional stories already, hasn't had the courage. Um, do you have any advice for me, Andrew? Yes, and and I, I, I've already um, come out with it once, but I'm going to say it again because it is so important. Uh, Louise, get an agent. Um, get something called the Artists and Writers Yearbook, which has the list of all the agents in uh, the United Kingdom, assuming you uh, you come from the United Kingdom. And um, I'm afraid it is a question of just going through those pages, working out the agents that say that they're interested in the area that you're interested in writing. Um, and um, sending them a sample chapter, uh, which I'm afraid it's got to be at least 5,000 words, a, um, a list of chapters, a CV, and um, a list of other books along the, of the same kind that you might be interested in uh, writing afterwards, because no agent just wants to take you on uh, for one book. They want to have a continuing relationship with you that's going to be profitable to both sides. So it's a um, it's a it's a struggle. Um, frankly, it wasn't for me because I was very lucky because I had a friend who was an agent. But uh, it's a struggle for a lot of people. But do not uh, just write a book on spec because it won't. It's very unlikely to get published. Very good advice to you, Louise. There two questions very similar from Sandeep and one which is anonymous uh, asking you about the depiction of Churchill in the darkest um, hour. Uh, how accurate was that, um, do you think? Uh, very accurate, yes. I think Gary Oldman really did his um, uh, did his homework. Uh, he's a huge Churchillian, actually, Gary Oldman. He loves Churchill. Um, downstairs in uh, my, amongst my bric-a-brac is Winston one of Winston Churchill's um, blue polka dotted um, bow ties, which I bought at auction, and the underbidder was Gary Oldman. <laughs> and uh, I think he caught the he caught the lovely um, uh, chuckle, the uh, the sort of the voice, the gravelly voice, and all of that. Um, the timing. Uh, he really um, he really is an excellent uh, Churchill. The, Churchill has been depicted in well over three hundred movies and TV shows, and I think Gary Oldman, along with Robert Hardy and and, and a few others, is really up there amongst the best. Uh, and do do people come and ask you for for your inside advice on these questions, or will they? Well, well, I, 
<laughs> they they don't because I am unfortunately such a terrible pedant when it comes to watching uh, history movies. There's a there's a, a terrible show called Churchill in which um, I think it was Trevor Cox played um, Churchill. Churchill, is it Brian Cox? Sorry, played Churchill, which made um, 120 factual errors in the course of this two hour show. And my wife won't go and watch um, history shows with me any longer. She says that all I do is tut tut and, and take out a piece of paper and note down mistakes, <laughs> things like that. So I'm afraid it's a, it's a downside of being married to a historian, really. Um, and uh, she, of course, is very connected with theatre. Uh, and and um, but uh, Brian Cox, who is impersonating uh, Murdoch in succession uh, currently, but but doesn't have to impersonate him directly. So it's all right. Um, questions about Napoleon will take next. Um, and Devrim, if I pronounced that name correctly, uh, asks you, um, can you say anything more about what was so special and unusual about him? Why do we see such figures so rarely in, in history? I think the answer to that is that um, he just managed to connect together so many of the most important techniques of leadership, secrets of leadership um, almost. Uh, there are many other um, great leaders. I've written a little book called Leadership in uh, in War, in which there's a essay on uh, Napoleon. At the end of the essay, I list the 30 or so attributes that uh, Napoleon had um, more than any of the uh, any of the others. Now, this didn't stop him losing, of course, and making the terrible error of retreating the wrong way uh, back from Moscow and uh, and dying on St. Helena in exile. Um, but when it came to sheer leadership qualities, one after the other after the other, and a capacity also to compartmentalize his life so that he was able to uh, completely concentrate on one thing and then, as he said, put the idea in a drawer, close it, open another drawer, and then completely concentrate on another. So you get during the Battle of Austerlitz, um, he, uh, he stops um, for a moment and, and writes uh, a note to the um, the uh, prefect of Genoa, telling him to stop taking his mistress to the opera. Um, there's a moment when he's in the 1812 campaign. Also, um, he is uh, uh, at the Kremlin, and the Kremlin is 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 starting to burn down. But he realizes that it's not going to actually burn down immediately. So he has enough time to write the. Um, the rules of the girls' school that he wants to set up in Saint Denis, and the regulations covering the Comédie Française. It's the most extraordinary brain to be able to do that whilst all these other things are going on at the same time. Question from Maureen about the libidos of great leaders. Um, why do so many great leaders seem to have expansive libidos? Um, uh, Kennedy, Roosevelt, um, Napoleon and Wellington, of course. Yes, I think that is fair. David Lloyd George being the classic example, of course, the man who won the war was also the man who, when asked whether or not he was going to take Mrs. Lloyd George to the Paris Peace Conference, answered, would you take sandwiches to a banquet? Um, which I think you'll agree, Maureen, is an appalling remark for a prime minister to make, even off the record. But nonetheless, um, he did. Um, Equally, however, you have people, and I'm just thinking about this Leadership in War book, people like uh, George Marshall and um, Margaret Thatcher and Winston Churchill, who were entirely um, uh, faithful to their spouses. So I don't think it's an inevitable prerequisite of, of greatness to, uh, to, to be an adulterer. A uh, question uh, here from Daniel about Boris Johnson and are there Churchillian uh, qualities in, in Boris Johnson and is he going to, he appears to be having um, his uh, um, black dog moments now while he's actually inside Downing Street, maybe Covid related. Um, how do you see his uh, premiership evolving? Gosh, that also is a very uh, testing question. Are you going to be doing Boris at 10? 
Uh, well, yes, if he, if, uh, no me. doubt. I, I, I always think it's the last, but you know, there's just something that I just suddenly find myself um, uh, are writing. It's too interesting. It's too fascinating. Yeah. Um, and he is fascinating. Uh, he, is. he is. And and I do you know, that's very interesting. I hadn't thought about him being perhaps a, a depressive. Um, it's not impossible, is it? I, I don't know whether or not that's a, a, a COVID thing. Um, very often um, one thinks of Samuel Johnson and, and Lord Salisbury, uh, you know, uh, Alan Clark, you know, um, Tories very often are one way or another. Um, but I haven't, I've, I've known Boris fairly well for 20 years or so, and I've never, certainly never seen him in a, in a depressive state. Um, how do I think he's going to do? It really is absolutely anyone's guess. I, I personally think he'll be he'll be a fine prime minister because he has got this um, this sense of Churchillianness. Um, his uh, his book is criticised endlessly, but it's a good thing when uh, when politicians write books about about great predecessors. I, I, I wish more um, politicians were interested in history more. And uh, and so, you know, well done him. Also, one has to remember that it was an attempt, that book was an attempt to bring younger readers to Ch Churchill for the first time and to try to, um, to try to sort of disseminate Churchill to a younger audience. It wasn't a sort of considered um, massive biography um, on the on the sort of scale of Churchill walking with destiny. Uh, a question here from David about uh, the attacks on Churchill, the attacks on Churchill's statue, the embarrassment that some people feel about uh, uh, standing up for figures like Churchill. W what's happened uh, that uh, somebody who comes out as regularly as Britain, the greatest Britain of all times, uh, is now a, a figure um, in the eyes of, of, of some of, of uh, uh, of um, distaste and uh, and um, hate. Well, first of all, I think you're right. It's to say some because there was a uh, a poll taken, I think, by Policy Exchange, the think tank, which um, showed that only about five percent of people approved of that um, um, vandalising of uh, of Churchill statue in Parliament Square. So it's not a an overwhelming. Um, uh, majority by any means. But the fact is that he was he was born when um, Charles Darwin was still alive and he believed in a hierarchy of the races. He thought that it was a uh, scientific fact and although we know today that, um, that that's obscene and absurd, um, they the, in those days scientists believed it too. Um, and so as a result he did make um, completely unacceptable um, racial jokes and um, and uh, remarks that um, are quite rightly thought of as disgusting were they said by somebody living today but he died half a century ago it's um, what he actually did for uh, the people native peoples of the empire what he actually did in ensuring that Botswana for example didn't fall into the hands of the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa, what he actually did for um, for Indians in the uh, in the British Empire um, was a uh, was a, a good thing, protecting them apart from anything else from the Japanese who killed 17 percent of all Filipinos in the Second World War. So I think you've got to see it again and again in the uh, proper historical context. One area that I think is a is a monstrous um, and, and, and totally unhistorical attack on him is uh, trying to make him out to be some kind of genocidal maniac because of the uh, Bengal famine. I go into this over six, seven pages in my uh, book. And in fact, if anything, uh, the famine would have been worse had it not been for um, Winston Churchill, a view that's just, I see, been supported by a Pulitzer Prize winning historian in America. Indeed. Um, and final question, Dan is asking about how COVID is going to affect your writing um, of, of specifically of George III. Um, we're almost out of time there. Um, yes, uh, I, I caught uh, COVID right at the beginning, very mildly. Um, and so it's uh, it's uh, I've got I've been 
you know, I've been positive and now I'm negative, so it's not going to affect me. The question will be whether or not it affects the number of people who uh, who read books. At the moment, uh, that has gone up because more people have got more time on their hands. So uh, now we're going to bring it to a close and I'm going to ask you to make two uh, quick uh, decisions. Uh, the first is, uh, which historian um, who uh, has is the most inspiring uh, that you've ever come across? Golly, what a fantastic question. Um, it, I, it has to be my my old Cambridge uh, teacher, Norman Stone. Oh, I thought you were going to say that. Oh, uh, did you? Yeah, I did. He, he, I did. Yeah, personally inspiring uh, as an individual, but also I think the way he, he wrote uh, his book on the Eastern Front uh, in the First World War, uh, several other other books, uh, The um, Atlantic and Its Enemies is a wonderful book. Um, I, I think that uh, he had a beautiful way with the English language at the same time as being uh, a great burrower of the uh, truths in archives. So, uh, so Norman, who died only uh, a year or so ago, um, I put him right up there on my pedestal. And Andrew spoke uh, very memorably about him at the memorial service uh, at St Martin's in the Field. Um, uh, and fi finally, I'm going to ask you, you can take one prime minister with you to a desert island, St Helena or somewhere else. Um, and you've written about several. This is going to really force you down. Who would you most uh, want to uh, have as your companion? It's obviously Churchill. I'm afraid it's Churchill every time. Of course it is. I'd love to spend a, an evening with William Pitt, the younger or elder. I'd love to to meet um, lots of them. But I would literally today give my little finger. I would put it in a guillotine and let you chop it off for the opportunity to spend some time with uh, with somebody, uh, a personality as gigantic as as Winston Churchill's. Uh, and there he is, he's buried just um, uh, 20 miles uh, less and was born just 20 miles uh, from here at the University of Buckingham. Andrew Roberts, thank you very much for a very um, thoughtful uh, and, and uh, riveting uh, hour with you. We're deeply grateful. Thank you all of you to, to listening. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hugo Vickers tomorrow night on um, uh, who's going to be talking about the truth about the monarchy, uh, Marie Elsa Bragg uh, on spirituality and wholeness, and then Angie Hunter on the anniversary of 9-11, talking about being with Tony Blair on the day that changed history, are uh, some of those coming up. Uh, but Andrew, that was a magnificent talk, and from us all, we are deeply grateful, uh, and thank you so very much. Thank you very much.